Hi everyone, welcome to a philosophical geometry class and um, I've got a little different format today um, which is going to be, I'm going to do like a live Q&A session and I've got it set up so I can actually read the comments and questions and everything that come in. So uh, please go ahead and, um, and ask away today. Uh, we've had a lot of classes, I guess this is our 25th class, and uh, I wanted to make sure that everyone's tracking along the way uh, with uh, all the stuff that we're learning and everything, and um, also have any questions that, uh, that come up uh, so that we can get them answered. I'm not yet seeing any questions from uh, the Facebook crowd or comments, so I'm wondering if this is kind of a different setup. So let me make sure that this is working right. This is my first time to use it this way on my computer. So Jamie Janover, if you're there, uh, go ahead and uh, post a comment or something. Okay, it looks like Jamie just commented. <clears throat> and looks like we've got some people coming on now. That's great. So um, we've had a, a lot of different things we started off with. So just to kind of give a quick recap, we started off with the stuff related to Metatron's cube. We also uh, drew a bunch of different geometries. We learned how to draw the flower of life. We learned how to draw and, uh, and we learned the philosophy also behind squaring the circle. And um, we have learned a lot about Vitruvian Man and Da Vinci. We've learned a lot about the philosophy of geometry and what geometry is intended, I think, to do, which is to really help us to evolve to our next iteration. Uh, geometry has this powerful way of communicating with the soul. It also communicates with the subconscious mind. And, um, and many of you have sent me stuff, uh, pictures that you've drawn, other things that you basically worked on and done over the course of the last few weeks. And I'm totally blown away uh, with the response that I've had. It's been amazing. And uh, so now is your chance to ask a bunch of questions. So we've got questions here coming up on uh, Instagram. So let me go ahead and just see if I can read some of these. Okay. Have you studied holy geometry in school or in self-study? Um, I did it all in self-study. I mean, I was good in school. I definitely uh, was good in math in school. But, um, you know, I chose to go into a business career. And I, I went to MBA school and, and studied finance. And, um, and that's where I kind of built up my career. I worked in the healthcare industry. Now, I have had lots of other experiences in healthcare, uh, as well as in physics and photonics, uh, and spent you know, almost 30 years of my career doing those very disparate types of things. I've lived all over the world and uh, been able to manage businesses overseas. So I lived in uh, UK for seven years. I lived in France for for a year, lived in Germany for three, lived in Australia for three years, lived in Korea for two years, lived in Japan for two years, uh, lived in Hong Kong for a year. So I've definitely had a very broad experience on many, many different fields. And, uh, and so that certainly helped. Uh, and I think geometry is something that is, you get to a certain stage in life and then you get super interested in it. It's not something that I think it's, it's difficult to teach the wisdom of geometry to eighth graders. Uh, it's just lost on them. You know, I was just joking with one of my friends earlier today that I was finding that in trigonometry that I hadn't gone back and really, really you know, gone deeply into um, ever in my life. But the last time I really spent a lot of time studying it would have been probably in 10th or 11th grade. And um, I had no appreciation for what it could do uh, at that time in my life. And so it didn't, the weight of it didn't come until now much, much later. So I've found this to be something that I've kind of gotten excited about later in life. Okay. <laughs> okay, the real life Robert Langdon. Um, okay, did you see the 15 year old who meditated and disappeared? I did not. Um, that's an interest, that sounds interesting though. Anyone who can do that, uh, they definitely deserve to get some attention for that. Um, math, mathematics can be intended like a dimension. Mathematics can be intended like a dimension. Well, I think all dimensions are based on mathematics. So um, if that's what you mean, definitely dimensionality is uh, limited by mathematics or enabled rather by mathematics. What is the name of the pedal you showed a bit back, the 3D physical object that you reflected light through in your room? 
Ah, that is the, uh, that, that's called the Tryon Ray. Uh, the Tryon Ray is something that is the petals that are kind of in between or the overlapping sections of the flower of life. And it's kind of shaped like this. I have one, I won't go grab it right now, but it's shaped like this. And it's just like the petals of the flower of life, Tryon Ray. And that was uh, innovated or found, I guess, by one of the geometers that works on our team, uh, his name being Michael Evans. And, uh, and he's often on these geometry uh, uh, classes as well. I've seen him many times on here. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Hello from sunny Florida. Enjoying your classes. Have you studied any Descartes? Yes, I have. Uh, in fact, I got a question this morning about Descartes and about Cartesian planes. And that's where Cartesian uh, coordinate system comes from. It's from Descartes. So uh, Descartes was an interesting philosopher and mathematician. Again, another geometer who became a, a real philosopher and is known as much for his philosophy as he is for his mathematics. Um, he did a lot of work on the pineal gland as well. And um, I, I think Descartes is another one of the great polymaths in history. When are we going on for a trip in your time machine? Well, see, I believe that actually, I, I used to think differently about this, but now one of the things that I've kind of uh, learned is that it seems like we could probably do time travel uh, from our own living rooms. Um, I think as we start to expand our understanding of dimensionality of time, I think what happens is we start to uh, realize that we can access other dimensions in ways that we couldn't otherwise have done, which is really fascinating to me because I like to compare it to kind of like a, uh, you know, the landing page on Netflix, for example. And on that landing page, basically what you find is, is all these different realities that are running simultaneously and you can turn your focus and attention to one or others, and you can turn that attention and focus to be able to dip into other versions of time and space. And, and I don't think it requires DMT. I, I think it's just a natural progression of what it means to be a human being. So I don't think we actually will need time machines, but uh, not to say that there won't be those that could be created. And I think as we talk about other dimensions, and a lot of times I, I believe that when we talk about extra, extraterrestrial beings, et cetera, a lot of the time, the reason why people cannot access them or be able to experience them while others can is that, um, is that they are, tend to be in higher dimensions, uh, not in lower dimensions, and they're not bounded by time the way that we are. That's how they get past the, the light speed barrier, I believe. Uh, and I definitely do believe in in extraterrestrial beings. Um, and I have had uh, some experiences directly uh, with them as well, which I won't necessarily go into here. But I will say this, that uh, that I believe that it's, it's very real and the next evolution of mankind is going to be uh, an expanded awareness and expanded consciousness. And for us to go and experience that, you have to first be able to learn how to balance the mind, which takes me to the next question from Carrie Ma which is, uh, please talk about the heart and brain coherence and reality experiences. Um, I think that the, the one of the main reasons that we come here, that we live here on earth, and I believe that we are eternal beings, is that we are here to learn. We, we, we come into separation, right? We, we learn separation uh, immediately. We all of a sudden get separation anxiety when we leave our parents. Uh, and that happens when we're, you know, it could be as early as only a few days old, as soon as we start to recognize what our parents are and mean to us. And then you get into this world of separation and we get deeper and deeper into this illusion of separation. And as such, what we're really trying to do is to learn how to find our way back. And we start to learn very early on that it's not okay to be emotional. You know, when a little boy cries, the, the parents may say, uh, you know, to the little boy, hey, stop crying, don't be a sissy. Well, actually, um, you know, crying and expressing emotion is not a bad thing at all, but we teach them to not be sissies and somehow it's a bad thing. Well, I think one of the points that I'm trying to make here is that as we learn separation, we also learn, and as I did, we also learn that it may not be so good to express emotion. And the better thing is as we get older and older, and we go through kind of a midlife crisis, then all of a sudden we have to reconnect with our hearts because we've pushed away our feelings so far from the self, so far from who we 
want to perceive ourselves as. You know, I've talked about narcissism is not true self-love. Narcissism is falling in love with the reflection. Uh, and if you go back to uh, Narcissus, actually, that's the story. As he looked at himself in this clear pool of water, you could see the mirror reflection of him in this pool of water. And he fell in love with that reflection. He fell in love with what he thought he was projecting to the outside world, not exactly who he truly was. And we are all good and we are all bad. And what happens is we only start to, we, we create this persona for ourselves that is only one aspect of ourselves until we learn full acceptance of others and full acceptance of ourselves. And once we learn full acceptance of others and self-acceptance, then it changes everything because our perception of ourself will change, our perception of others change, and we start to accept rather than judge everyone. You know, we all subconsciously ju judge ourselves. We judge ourselves consciously and subconsciously. We put on airs. We only want to be seen a certain way. We only, it's, it's only okay to look tough and strong if that's the persona you've built up. It's only okay to be hyper masculine or hyper feminine. It's only okay to be one or the other. It's not okay to be something kind of in between. And that's very, you know, unaccepted from a societal perspective. And I believe that the merger of the heart and brain comes as you start to learn that acceptance of your other half, to do the shadow work, to start to merge with your other aspects of yourself that have been totally unaccepted for all these years on who you are. And, and as soon as you do that, then the heart raises and a heart brain starts to come into play. And when the heart brain comes into play, then all of a sudden you're lighting up all your chakras, you're lighting up all of your dimensionality and you're able to experience life in a very loving way. And it may not be that all of a sudden everything becomes easy for you, but your perception of what is happening to you changes dramatically and you no longer judge yourself. And so therefore you no longer judge others. And that's one of the greatest things that could ever happen as we learn that our separation is the illusion and that fear and scarcity are actual illusions and that we are never alone. And in fact, our hearts are always with us. And if we could tap into our heart, and I've said this many times and the Sim Herman says it too, which is, you know, looking for your thoughts inside your brain is like looking for the radio announcer inside the radio box. He's not going to be there or she's not going to be there. Um, but if our brain is the receiver, like a radio is, and then can transmit that information, then basically we can think of our heart as the dial on what we're going to be tuning into. It's going to be either a high frequency because we're in a place of hope and love and, and empowerment, or it's going to be in a low frequency when we're feeling afraid and scarce. You know, I, I, I saw someone posted a meme today that I thought was kind of cool, and I took a picture of it, and it's coming to mind for me right now, which is that there were two uh, people in this picture, and you could either choose you know, one or the other. It was a kind of a cartoon thing. Let's see if we can find it here. Well, it looks like, I don't know where it went. But basically what it had was, uh, there were two memes that I saw that were great. And one I posted before, which is the butterfly uh, sitting next to the, uh, the, the caterpillar. And, you know, the butterfly is reading a newspaper and the caterpillar basically is looking at the butterfly and says, man, you've changed. And the butterfly looks back at it and says, yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to change. And, and I think that is probably one of the most important realizations I've come to in my whole life, which is that as we evolve, as we change, we literally become like the Vitruvian man, the Vitruvian man being, if you notice, you know, this picture of the Vitruvian man, right? This picture of the Vitruvian man is basically, um, you know, four arms and four legs. And if you study Da Vinci, you'll know that Da Vinci did a lot of writing about the, uh, about the dragonfly. And the dragonfly was a very important aspect of what he was trying to teach. He did a lot of studying about it. And dragonflies go through this whole life where they spend half their lives underwater. They're born as larvae and then they end up growing up. And then one day they come out of their kind of cocoon state and then they go and fly and they see an entirely different world. So that's their adult experience. And as such, you know, that is such a, a major shift for, for the dragonfly. Can you imagine you live your whole life, half of it is underwater, and then the other half 
is outside in the air, outside. I mean, kind of amazing to think of it that way. And so basically, I believe it's the same thing that happens for us. As we get to this realization of who we are and acceptance of who we are, then we do get this butterfly effect, right? And the butterfly effect also has different meanings, meaning that if a butterfly in physics, they talk about this a lot, and flap its wings, then could it potentially on the other side of the planet eventually build momentum and cause, you know, a hurricane or something. But, but you know, this notion of evolution for human consciousness and going to the next level of who we are intended to be, uh, I think is such a powerful part of what our message is. And, and I, I, I don't lose the metaphor of the fact that we're all kind of in a cocoon state right now. Um, I can't think of another time in the history of mankind where the whole world has been on quarantine like it is right now. And there has to be a reason for that. And I believe there's a reason for everything. And it is ultimately transmutation. Speaking of DMT, the flower of life is such a prevalent vision as well as sound producing visions. Any thoughts or comments on this phenomenon, whether it be from an uh, entheogen or endogenous DMT? Okay, well, I, I've never tried DMT. Um, I think that DMT is uh, powerful in that it helps people to kind of wake up and it's kind of a shortcut, I think, to, to getting to higher states of consciousness. But I've also seen some of the negative side effects of, of DMT. And I've literally seen some people that kind of get addicted to it as well and want to keep you know, sitting with the medicine and become sitting with the medicine, sitting with the medicine. I'm not at all against it. Um, I think that it's great, but we also can produce natural DMT inside our brains. In fact, the hope is if you're going to try DMT, that it will induce your own natural production of DMT or that you'll be able to tap into it you sort of take the seal off through this one usage and then you'll be able to get access to it. Uh, I've never had a problem not being able to access higher states of, of consciousness and not in the last several years anyway. And I think going to the pyramid was, was, was like that for me the first time. Uh, it definitely did something to me. It changed me dramatically. But even leading up to that visit, uh, I was feeling very much changed. And and so I don't think everyone needs to go to DMT. I, I can't tell you how many times I get questions for people saying, dude, you got to try DMT. You got to try it. It's like, well, actually, if you go down the path of geometry, self-discovery, self-acceptance and non-judgment, you will access DMT in your own mind. Uh, I'm convinced of that. I don't think it needs to be an external drug for you to access. Uh, but again, I'm not against people that decide to, to use it because I think that uh, it, it does turn people on and opens them up in ways that, that they would probably perceive that would never have been possible for them had they not uh, had the DMT. Now, will I ever try it? I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I, I like being on this planet for now. I'm enjoying where I am and what I'm doing. I don't necessarily feel the need to go and do that uh, because I feel very tapped into uh, the, the multidimensionality of, of who I am right now. And I wouldn't have said that even a few years ago. So I think there's something about turning 50 uh, that made a big difference for me. Uh, Walter Russell talks about turning 50 and how a man as he turns 50, if, if he's tapped into the self-acceptance, will actually be more creative and, and accomplish more things after 50 than before 50. And that's very counterintuitive to what the world would tell us. So I've read all of his books and, you know, I think going inward instead of being so externally focused all the time is one of the most powerful things that I think I have ever experienced. And uh, that is the thing I'm most grateful for. So I don't feel the need to try DMT right now, but I will definitely, uh, I'm sure, be confronted with that question yet again, many times over from the New Age community in particular. <laughs> Can you comment on the future of non-lethal robotic security systems to respond to active shooters and our shift to a world beyond violence? Well, again, I, I've said this before, too. I definitely believe that, you know, what we perceive um, in the world around us is a reflection of how we perceive ourselves. So if we're in a calm and beautiful state with ourselves and and liking ourselves and accepting ourselves, then we'll end up reflecting that experience around us 
all the time. And, and it's kind of like the stuff that you judge is the stuff that you'll continue to attract. If you stop judging, then you'll stop attracting all those weird type of experiences. And once you realize that it's a mirror, uh, then it can change everything. And I think that, you know, being the change that you want to see in the world is meaning first and foremost to love and accept who you are, your complete self, you know, it's not just that, oh, I like myself, but I don't like my butt, or I like myself, but I don't like, you know, how I'm overweight, or I like myself, but I don't like that I, I don't have any talents, or I like myself, but I don't like whatever it is, putting conditions on it. You know, it's just like we put conditions on our time and our experience. Oh, life is not too bad right now, but as soon as I finish, you know, school and I graduate and I can go and get my real job, then I'll really be happy. Or I have a real job and everything, but now the thing that's missing on my checklist is I don't have the right husband or husband or wife, right? Or, you know, I have everything. I have the husband and wife or I have my job, but I don't have kids yet. So we place all kinds of conditions on our happiness and the more conditions that we place on our happiness, the more conditions we experience around us. Those conditions being the things that we have judged until we stop and take a moment and say, I'm happy with what I have. I have a great life. I have a great family. I have uh, you know, wonderful children. I have uh, all the abundance that I really need. What else would I need more? Is there anything more that I truly need? I've traveled enough. I've seen the world enough. I've lived my dreams. I've done all these things. I've experienced life. And once you make that decision that you're happy with what you have and that you don't need anything anymore, because every time you judge that you need something, the things that you believe that you will need will be elusive to you. They'll be gone. You will not find them, whether that's money or whatever it is, love or, or happiness. You know, another meme I saw this morning was kind of a joke against the people that were uh, idiotic and foolish because they were happy all the time. And that meme I thought was really fascinating because basically saying, you know what, I, I, the people that believe that they, they can be happy all the time and experience life that way are the ones that, that you know, are the idiots. Whereas the people that know the truth and how bad life really is and are, and are unhappy because they understand the worst circumstances, they're the ones, yeah, here it is. <laughs> I'll put this up so you guys can see this. Hopefully, let's see. Okay. Uh, let me pull it back. Focus, come on, you can do it. Camera, there we go. All right, it says, it is better to be unhappy and know the worst than to be happy in a fool's paradise. <laughs> you know what? I'd rather be the fool in paradise. I don't know about you guys, but all the people that are the pessimists out there that say, you know what? It's better to be unhappy and know how bad things really are than it is to be a fool living in paradise. Hmm. I don't know. I'd rather be the fool living in paradise. What do you guys think? All right. Let's see. What other questions do we have? Microdosing psilocybin, yang into lead microdosing. That's why his politics is awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't really know his politics. So um, do you think we are separate consciousness or only one singularity of consciousness from different perspectives? Uh, I believe we're one, one singularity of consciousness and we have different perspectives and those different perspectives define the different realities that we experience. Okay, the eye of darkness plus minus Corona, the sun, the crown of thorns, Jesus, a message for mankind. It was interesting yesterday, uh, I was driving through the city of Corona and, and uh, I, was, I was talking with Susie about, about this idea of <laughs> what's happening to the sales of Corona tomatoes and what's happening to the sales of Corona beer, which apparently are all down because people don't want to get anything related to Corona which I thought was pretty funny. And then I thought, well, what about Newport Beach, California, where there's this whole beach, you know, Corona Del Mar. Or they have to change Corona Del Mar because now the real estate's going to go down. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. It, it really does come down to how we perceive the world around us. That defines our experience. And once we decide to perceive it as the fool living in a fool's paradise, 
then we can experience a fantastic existence. Law of attraction, absolutely. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> you know what? The thing is, is that once you realize the way that this world actually works, I find it very freeing. Um, I find it extremely liberating for me because once I realized how the world actually works and I could apply my mind to that and how I'm actually creating the reality around me and there's nobody else but me to blame for that reality, it was very comforting actually because it wasn't so much that I had to change all the reality around me. I just had to change my perspective on the reality around me. And by changing that perspective on the reality around me and realizing that nothing is separate, then my whole reality around me changed. So that's what it means to be the change. Be the perspective shift. Imagine yourself sitting upon an orb maintaining balance. Ask every question to yourself and a yes or no answer to be given. Wrestling every topic that through meditation this way can help achieve better balance. If you tip forward or backwards, answers are no. If you feel a bottom, uh, if you feel emotion to the left, to right, redefine the questions, take it to the core of it. Once you achieve balance, the world may look a little different. Fair enough. What happened in Egypt that changed me? Um, so my first trip to Egypt was in, I, I'd wanted to go, by the way, my whole life. There was, in fact, I can't even remember a time when I didn't dream about going to Egypt. Like my entire life was sort of like leading up to a moment in time when I would go to Egypt. And, and I went uh, with Residence Foundation in 2017. And uh, I had never taught any of the work I had done in mathematics to the outside world, except for to the scientific community and to those that I had been uh, working closely with, like Nassim and others on the on the team. And um, he asked me to, to give a presentation on it um, in Egypt uh, with this trip in 2017. And some of the people on this call were probably there. And when I gave the presentation, I didn't know what to expect from the crowd. I was shocked when, after I taught my 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 course, which was not really a course at that time, it was just a presentation on um, the language of universal consciousness. Uh, half the room at the end of the presentation was crying, like weeping. And that was really shocking to me because I, I didn't really know how people would respond to it. And some people kind of commented, they felt like they just watched the real life version of that movie um, Arrival, where the linguist taught you know, the language of the uh, the heptopods, the seven legged aliens that were extra dimensional. They, they had figured out a way to break out of time as a boundary condition. And, and so uh, right after that, that afternoon, um, I went uh, back to my room and I was getting ready because I was the speaker, right? It was the last speaker before we went into the Great Pyramid and we spent the whole night in the Great Pyramid and um, the two other pyramids as well, Catherine and Minkari. And I didn't know what to expect, but I was very excited about going to the pyramid because we'd already been in Egypt for about five or six days at that point. And it had been building up and building up. Um, and I really wanted to go. We went, of course, to the outside of the Great Pyramid a couple of days before that. And it was fascinating because the week I was there was the same week that the shooter in Las Vegas shot all those innocent people in front of um, in front of the fake pyramid at Luxor in Vegas. And so literally a couple of days before that, and there were 500 people shot in Las Vegas approximately. And here we were by the real pyramid. We had a couple hundred people there and it was an incredibly uh, enlightening and a bit of a jolting of an experience, I'd say. And that night we went into the Great Pyramid and I laid in the sarcophagus and I got to uh, to meditate inside the sarcophagus and something shifted. Uh, I don't know exactly how best to describe it, but something changed in me and I started being able to see um, different dimensions of time and that changed a lot. Like I could see even my past lives and Please don't ask me about my past lives and stuff because I it's something very sacred and important to me, but I don't talk about. So um, I, I generally will not. But I started remembering 
my past lives, I started remembering other people's lives. I started remembering their current lives. I, I could uh, see time very differently and I could see time backwards in time. And I could say to somebody, I see you on a driveway standing in front of a green Vega uh, and you're wearing a striped shirt, horizontal shirt. You're about 15 years old. And the man I'm talking to is 50 years old or 60 years old. And, and I could describe in detail the experiences that he actually had earlier in his life that I was never privy to. I didn't even know the person at that time. And, and to watch, and not just one person, but many, many people now uh, have that experience where they remember back to that moment, uh, identically to the way I described it, was uh, a bizarre thing for me. It definitely changed me. Uh, like, I don't know how best to describe it. And that's how I became friends with uh, some of the managers that run the Giza Plateau, because uh, the moment I had left the King's Chamber, I was sitting on the Great Step, which is the long staircase in the Grand Gallery. The very last step before you go into the King's Chamber uh, is, is this step called the Great Step. And it's a much higher step than all the other ways sort of leading up to that. It's not stairs. They're like these long wooden planks that you put over it. And it's kind of like steps, but it's not steps. And the last step is a real step. And I was sitting there and I didn't know at the time that I was sitting under the exact apex of the Great Pyramid for about 45 minutes. And nobody ever sits there because that's not a place that, unless you're in the know, that you would even think to sit. But one of my friends um, and my assistant uh, today, uh, Victoria Foster, was not feeling well. She'd been kind of overwhelmed in the, uh, in the King's Chamber. And so we come outside to get some fresh air. We're still inside the pyramid, but by the Great Step. And I sat there and I talked to one of the people that manages the Giza Plateau. And I thought he was just a tour guide. I had no idea who he was or, or what he was. And he asked me some questions and I started giving him, like I could just, in that one moment, I could see his life up to that point. And I told him exactly what he had experienced and I told him exactly what he needed to forgive and how he could forgive and heal himself of the pain that he had experienced. And um, he, he happened to be a homosexual man and his father died and he was not on good terms with his father because his father was, uh, was very anti-gay. And, and, and so, you know, he would beat this, this, this man and, and then his father died and he blamed himself for his father dying and them not having reconciled. And um, I remember telling him that, you know, it wasn't his fault. I mean, going into details about his mother and everything, like, and, and he was like streaming down with tears. And this was the first experience that I'd ever had. And then I've now done that probably with about 100, 200 people uh, where I can see what is blocking them and holding them back that they haven't forgiven themselves. Uh, and, and usually it's stuff from this life, but it could also be stuff from, from prior lives. So I've told you probably more than I've told anybody else ever, but that was probably the biggest shift, but it wasn't only uh, that moment where I could see the past, I could also see future. And one of the things that I came away with as well is that past and future, we see it as linear and separate. <laughs> What if it's also one, just like we are one with each other, right? Uh, what if it's actually that what we perceive as our distant past is actually our far future? And, and that's what I'm proposing to you because our time illusion is really the perspective that we've decided to limit ourselves to. And we have the ability to go beyond that, just like a dragonfly has the ability to fly through different dimensions that it probably never would have thought even possible or even contemplated. And, and I think that is um, the next evolution of mankind. And I think that is what's coming to us. I believe that more and more people are going to start experiencing time and space and separation uh, and replacing those with, you know, feelings of gratitude and replacing them with joy and feeling uh, and, and replacing all of that with feelings of unity and singularity. And the first way you start seeing it is through synchronicities. You'll start noticing. If you haven't already, you'll start noticing like the same numbers showing up over and over again. And this is a very well-documented psychological phenomenon. Um, and Carl Jung has written several books about this very topic. And Carl Jung, I think, is 
the greatest psychologist of all time, psychiatrist. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, attribute most of, of the advances in psychiatry and psychology to, to uh, Sigmund Freud. But Carl Jung transcended well beyond that and went deep into understanding the alchemical path of the magnum opus and the great work. And that great work is to learn self-acceptance and love and, and forgiveness of all, uh, because all are just reflections, how you're perceiving the world around you from that which is projected within. It's the you inverse, not the you universe. So uh, I paint things before they happen. When I was younger, it really troubled me. Now it's okay. Uh, that's from uh, Brigida Muse. Uh, basically, Brigida, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, I've been getting tons and tons of synchronicities lately. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it comes a lot out in art because you're tapping into this field when you're bringing art from the, this field into manifestation, into reality. And art is one of the first places that you'll start to see a lot of that symbology manifesting into this form here. And, um, you know, that is absolutely the case. And you'll find that is true with dimensions of time. And you'll find a lot of your word is, work is prophetic. In fact, when I'll draw things, sometimes I will encrypt things without even knowing that I encrypted it. And then I'll go back later on and find the thing that, you know, was relevant to that moment in time in the future. There is a grand architect that is basically leading and guiding all of this. And it's so far beyond any comprehension of our own that it's hard for us to comprehend in concepts of linear time and comprehend how all of this works. But I can tell you that it all really does work. It's incredible. And um, finding that and, and, and getting deeper and deeper into understanding yourself and then also balancing the mind across the different centers of math, music, you know, uh, sciences and, and, and the arts and balancing all of that together forms the philosopher. Philosophy is not something you can just study, in my opinion, uh, and just go and, and get a degree in rhetoric and understanding argumentation and debate and all this other kind of stuff that usually is ascribed to philosophical ways of thinking. You can't learn to be a philosopher by simply studying the philosophers. You have to go through an autodidaction path on your own and you become philosophical as an end result of that path. It's not that, oh, I'm going to study about Plato. No, studying Plato and studying Kepler and studying Newton and all these great philosophers is something that is great to do because it will help ignite. It's kind of like taking the DMT. It, it, it opens something in you. You start seeing things. You start understanding things differently. But it's not absolutely required in order for us uh, to be able to get there. You can get there totally on your own. We have every tool that we need to find our way back embedded within our own anatomy and our own soul. You don't need anything more, but we get lost because we, we believe this illusion of, uh, of separation that, that is exactly that. It's an illusion and it's such a convincing illusion and it's made an illusion like that on purpose so that we will all be able to realize on our own one day something will click just like in the dragonfly. One day something clicks and then you go deep inside and you find yourself in quarantine. And then maybe at the end of the quarantine, you come out and you're a transformed person and in subtle and profound ways. Okay, let me go to the Instagram crowd and see what questions I've got here. Okay, have you heard about Andreas Clacker and his CDS solution for bacteria? Do you think COVID-19 will resurface and will continue throughout the year? Um, you know, I, I do find it interesting that COVID, uh, or the real name, is coronavirus. If you think about it, what's happening right now is the crown chakra is opening. And one of the names for crown is corona. It's, it's, it's the name for crown. So here we are in the crown virus. Yeah, you could say it's like a virus. And learning to transcend judgment so that you no longer judge good and evil, rather... Uh, that there's no such thing as good and bad. 
I know that's hard for people to basically grasp onto, but you know, as it gets more and more ridiculous watching the news these days, I can't even watch CNN without them saying something so ridiculously against Donald Trump. It's like over the fricking top. And then I can't even watch the Fox News because that's like total propaganda too. It's like, absolutely. So what happens is that's just a caricature and a metaphor for how we've all lived our lives for so long. We become blind because we choose not to see another person's perspective or view. We choose not to experience it. And whatever it is that we believe is more beneficial to us becomes the only ethical choice for society. And that's what happens with business every freaking day. You know, if you ask the people that are in the, uh, the Middle East that would be in Syria, that are trying to, in a way, um, you know, that, that, that basically are suicide bombers. You know, I, I have a friend who lost his 11 year old son last April to a suicide bomber in Sri Lanka. And it was a horrible story. I mean, little kid went to go visit his grandparents in Sri Lanka for a week and he ends up being the only person that dies inside this big hotel, which had a cafe in it that someone decided to blow themselves up in. And for some reason, the person, and clearly that was a retaliation against what happened in New Zealand a few months earlier, but the person who blew themselves up and their family probably thought them a hero for killing an 11-year-old innocent boy. How could you perceive that person as a hero? Well, you know, if we're out and we're in that mindset and we think that our religion is being attacked, then maybe it makes total sense to be a hero to blow yourself up, right, in the name of, of retribution or in the name which you might believe is actually a fundamental part of the Bible, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And, and I say the Bible on purpose because we all know that, you know, the Old Testament is shared by, by all the religions that basically don't like each other or have historically not liked each other uh, in particular. So Muslim, the, the, the Quran and, and the prophets of the of the Old Testament are one and the same. And the same thing with Judaism. And yet we can't find common ground. It makes no sense to me. So the, the point is that to one man, it may be trash. Another man, it may be treasure. It is all in the perspective. And our ability to empathize and to be able to see uh, their truth, no matter how polarized it might be, no matter how heinous, no matter how disgusting it might be, and I think that's what ultimately Christianity and all the, the, uh, the prophets throughout history have tried to teach that same philosophy. You know, obviously going away from this notion of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth towards, you know, a New Testament or a gospel that is one of love and acceptance, love thy neighbor, turn the other cheek. That is an understanding that is as much about understanding yourself as it is about understanding anyone else around you. So, you know, I, I, I definitely believe that this hyper polarized world, which was well predating what was happening with coronavirus, is now something that can be a lesson, can be a teacher for us all, that it's become so ridiculous, so almost like a caricature that it's like it's 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 so fake. And this concept of fake news and everything on both sides of the equation, whatever the sides are. So whatever you see as sides, get rid of the sides and recognize it's the self. Get rid of sides of your perspectives and your, you know, your polarized dimensionality and recognize that it is you, it is us, it is who we are, it is how we are perceiving the world around us. And that's really hard to accept. And believe me, it was hard for me to accept, very difficult to accept, but now, I absolutely have tried very hard to break out of those singular concepts that I had been, you know, basically ingraining in my persona for so many years. And this is, uh, it's, it's, it's the great work. It's the hardest thing to basically let go of. How we perceive the world is a hard thing to let go of. And sometimes, you know, doing things in a grounded fashion will help. You know, for me, I switched to vegetarian right after I got back from Egypt this time. And I'd always eaten meat. And I 
never conceived of liking the idea at all of, of becoming a vegetarian. Now I've been a vegetarian for two months. And it's funny because I was just talking to my doctor the other day and my doctor's like, oh, I can't wait to take your cholesterol. I can't wait, you know, now to take your blood pressure. I can't wait to look at all of your vitals, you know, after coronavirus, because I have a feeling it's all going to change. And he's not even a vegetarian himself, but he wants to just see it as a litmus test. And, and it's, I can tell you, I feel much, much better, but I had fought against it forever and ever because I'd said, oh, this is ridiculous. I'd always come up with, because I thought eating meat benefited me somehow, some way. And again, I'm not trying to say that everyone should be vegan or everyone should be vegetarian or everyone should be whatever. I'm not saying that. In fact, I'm saying the exact opposite. There is no should be's. There are no should be's. It's just, I am. And whatever it is that I feel I'm about to judge, instead of judging it, I believe now, I try to stop myself and say, I am that, I am. Whatever that is. Whatever it is that I was about to be on the precipice of judging in someone else, I stop myself now and just try to say, I say it faintly and I say it out loud even, I just say, I am that, I am. And it's been easier to do that while on quarantine because I'm not sitting in the office, you know, wanting to say, hey, you're lazy, dude. You didn't get that job done. And now I'm sitting there saying, I am that. I am. The things that we are tempted by, the things that we do ourselves, but we do not want to show anyone else that we do do. The things that we don't want anything to be associated, we don't want anyone to perceive association with us whatsoever, are the things that we judge in other people. Take that and suck that down because that is reality. That is reality. And anyone that says, oh, no, no, I, my judgments are all righteous. No, you're full of shit. That is absolutely your perspective and it's a limited one. And the longer we stick to those old perspectives of only you know, the mono or unidimensionality, the more difficult time we'll have to love ourselves and accept who we are. So, uh, let's see, we've got some Spanish, but this thing is moving so fast, it's hard to read. So, what are your thoughts on, oh, I lost it again, okay. What are your thoughts on Sankhya philosophy? Uh, I don't know much about it. Um, hermeticism. So, people ask me a lot about hermeticism. What is hermetic wisdom? Well, hermeticism is a philosophy. I wouldn't say it's a religion. And... People ask me all the time, am I religious? Um, I was, I grew up Catholic. I was baptized uh, Catholic, but then my father uh, was Episcopalian. So I went to Episcopalian church. And then when I turned a teenager, became a teenager, I uh, started to uh, date a girl who was Mormon and I ended up converting. Next thing you know, I'm in South Korea as a Mormon missionary when I'm 19 years old. And I'm trying to give out the Book of Mormon to people. <laughs> it was crazy. I'm so grateful for the experience. I felt at 17 or 18 years old that I needed discipline. And um, I wanted to buckle down. And, and, you know, I saw that people that went to be missionaries came back changed and more mature and but I didn't realize that that was just pushing me more and more into the realm of judgment. And one of the things that I think is challenging with religion to find spirituality and peace and acceptance is that religions tend to try to dumb it down and try to um, teach you more judgment. This is right, this is wrong. When actually you will find nowhere did Jesus talk about that. The central thesis of Christianity is Jesus, and he, he never once basically said, oh, you know what, this is good, this is evil. Not what he said. In fact, he said, judge not, lest ye be judged. And what he meant to say, now I understand this through hermetic thought and wisdom, is that judge not, lest ye judge yourself. So with that judgment you're casting on others, you are actually judging your own moat in your own eye. So I, uh, 
I left the Mormon church when I was about 30, uh, after I'd been a missionary and I kind of went up and through the ranks and they have a good system, right? There's like a whole system and I have nothing against the Mormon church either. I'm not against them. Uh, my daughter grew up Mormon. She's 24 years old now. And I've always been a supporter of the Church of Philosophy. When she decided to be a missionary in the south of France, I said, wow, you got lucky with your location. I didn't get to go there and live there until I was in grad school. But, you know, I, I encouraged her. And then when, when, you know, she came back, I encouraged her still. And she, like so many people around the world today, are, is going through a, a, a great kind of awakening right now. And, uh, and starting to see that the things that she had judged were, were not really the full truth. You know, there are, you could say that the things that we tend to judge are aspects of our truth. And once we start to learn that truth is dimensional, that it's, there's a, a singularity, it's just like the geometry I posted, which is, okay, I can see a shadow of a square and think that the geometry must be a square if I can't see the geometry, or I could see the shadow of a circle and think that it must be a circle if all I'm seeing is the shadow. But what if it's a cylinder? It's both, right? It will cast a shadow from one perspective that is a square. And people will argue and say, that's a square. That's a square, damn it. And then if the other people are looking from the other perspective in other direction, they'll say, whoa, that's a circle. That's not a square. That the people that think it's a square are crazy. They're idiots. I've just described Democrats and Republicans. I'm sorry. It just is what it is. This game of polarity. And we're so amazed when every time, you know, in the movies, whatever it is, it's like, oh, an election is won with one point. How is it that the conservatives are exactly half the population and the liberals are exactly half the population? That is part of the illusion. What we perceive is greater and stronger is where we've decided to define ourselves and our persona alongside of. And so, you know, this was something that I carried with my life all the way until I learned and experienced directly betrayal, because betrayal is what you learn and what you experience over and over and over again. When you are conditionally loving yourself, so when you need to learn how to love yourself before your transformation, your evolution, the experiences that you will see over and over and over again will be betrayal. Because betrayal is the definition of someone you were close to who let you down or hurt you or deliberately did something to try to damage you. And that betrayal teaches us to transcend from that perspe perspective and perception to a perception and acceptance of unconditional love of who we are. No matter what, if I fail, I still love myself. Then all of a sudden you'll notice you'll start failing a lot less. We are what we judge. We will attract everything we judge until we no longer judge what we attract. That is a 100% truism. That is fact. And I've, experienced it over and over and over again. So as I got later in life, and then I found this alchemical path, because I started noticing that all the people that I looked through history and said, you know, they, they, they weren't, you couldn't put them in one bucket. What bucket do you put Leonardo da Vinci in? What bucket do you put Isaac Newton? What bucket, bucket do you put Walter Russell in? You know, they were musicians, artists, philosophers, mathematicians, geometers, they were all these things. And when I started studying what they studied and I wanted to learn what they learned because I liked the way that they, most of the stuff that we learn in school have come from probably about a hundred different philosophers through time. Literally, almost all of what we learn in academia is taught in our teachings of these philosophers. And when you start studying what they mainly studied and what they mainly worked on, it was Hermeticism. Even in the case of Sir Isaac Newton, 80% of his work, and here's a man who discovered gravity and was an academician who wrote tons and tons of academic papers on his works, the inverse square law, you know, calculus, just to name a couple of things. He was a hermeticist. 80% of his work output was hermetic philosophy and the occult 
That's kind of a dirty little secret that Cambridge University doesn't want to tell anybody. That's why they sold all of his works off to Bill Gates. This notion of, you know, there being evil or, you know, this whole philosophy of there's a conspiracy. Yeah, all of those things can and will exist. As soon as you conceive them all, they will exist. And they're there to teach us. And generally, whatever it is that is the opposite of that experiential moment is what you are intended to learn. And you won't see it until it hits you in the head. And this is what I believe all those philosophers, all those polymaths, philosophers and philosopher kings were trying to teach us. Hermetic wisdom is about correspondence. It's about polarity. It's about, it doesn't matter what your creed is. You can follow any religion as long as you learn non-judgment. And hermetic wisdom teaches us and shows us the path of evolution for the soul. And that path of evolution for the soul becomes the great work. And the great work is where you will find your peace and joy. And it is all about the path to resurrection, where the old person dies. You know, I'm sure that the dragonfly, when all of a sudden it, it kind of finds itself going through this transformation, probably thinks it's dying until it realizes that it now has wings and it's not supposed to be underwater anymore. And it can experience a much higher dimensionality of itself. And maybe there was some dissatisfaction its whole life. You know, maybe it thought that its parents died. I mean, imagine parents would go off into a, to a cocoon or something and then they fly away. And then it's like a spirit going off <laughs> to some other place. I, I believe that the transformation of the soul that is taught in hermetic wisdom is exactly the same thing. And you will find that the hermeticists were all of these things. And the first most important thing is they learn the nature of the mirror and they learn the nature of this matrix of mind of experience that we see. And once they learn it to transcend that through their own self-acceptance, then they learn how to play the game. And in Hermeticism, it's called the Kybalion. So I am definitely considering myself a Hermeticist. Uh, I would highly recommend. And for those of you that would like to take my course, uh, I teach a lot on uh, Hermeticism in there and about the path to higher understanding. It wasn't just for mathematics that I went on this journey. I was I had to reconstruct my reality around me because I'd experienced so much. Um, and I had experienced so many things in this sort of existence that were so counter, so opposite of what I had thought and believed until that moment in time. And it, it really opened my mind in new ways um, and helped me to deal with this change that I believe many people are experiencing right now. I have someone on here who says, are you from Utah? We had Mormons in Sydney from there. Uh, yes. I was living, and maybe I knew you when I was in Sydney. Uh, my daughter was born in Sydney in uh, 1996. And, um, and I was not from Utah. I did not grow up in Utah, but the place that we had lived before we moved to Australia, uh, and I was in the Greenwich Ward for a while, uh, and then I was in uh, Balcom Hills uh, Ward as well. So uh, for Mana, hello, Mana, I may know you already. Uh, judge not lest you be judged. I was just thinking that right before you said it. Exactly a game of illusion through polarity. Absolutely. It makes the game exciting. Hey, it's never boring. That's for sure. What we're going through and experiencing right now is not boring. That, that is for sure. And, and now I, I have a different appreciation for it because now I just say, okay, I'm just going to surrender and I'm going to let what needs to transpire transpire and I'm going to find the love along the way. Stop and smell the roses. Take a moment to thank the world around you and thank the universe for giving you this time to be able to go within like you are and listen to me right now where otherwise you might just have to be at work. And you might not be able to have even this kind of conversation. 
So uh, with that, we're coming up on the last 20 or so seconds. Uh, I wanted to take this time today to, to not do geometry, but to give you just some sort of straight philosophy on life. And I think we'll be coming out of this quarantine soon. My birthday is May 16th, and I'm hoping that on May 18th, the Monday after, which is also the Pyramid Slope Angle Day, that that will be the day that the quarantine ends here in Southern California. And hopefully it will cascade to other places all around the world. I wish you all the best. And, and most importantly, to accept and love yourselves. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.